one of the reasons for choosing an, an androgynous name that was just um, uh, was the smallest part of creating the name. Um, we chose an androgynous name because for that first Farseer trilogy, I was writing first person male. And whenever you want, write fantasy, you want to do your best to lower the threshold of disbelief as much as you can. So um, any way that you can lower it, you do. Whether it's uh, s saying uh, this is going to be a male point of view, so I'm going to have a, a name that might be male, to uh, making sure that all of your facts about horses are absolutely correct, so that when you introduce a dragon, you have the trust of the reader, and the reader who believes you know about horses will now believe that you know about dragons. Well, this is a bit of a hobby horse for me, so if I, if I go too far with this, I think you'll have to stop me. Um, I remember reading quite a long time ago that um, somebody's theory that we keep pets because as humans, we are a lonely species. There is no other uh, species on the planet that we regard as being as, as intelligent and sentient as ourselves. So we bring pets into our home who, um, who love us, who are our friends, but don't necessarily uh, have anything to, to gain by uh, gaming our problems, for instance. Recently I went to see the movie Transformers. This does relate, believe it or not. And in the, in the movie Transformers you have this very large and powerful creatures that, that come into our world and some of them are wise and kind and helpful and others are just going to uh, smash and destroy and uh, either kill us or make us slaves or whatever. Um, it's a little bit like big brothers. You have, your, you have your big brother and maybe he protects you with the bully, from the bullies at school but maybe at home he takes your Halloween candy away from you. So my theory is that uh, in, in some ways um, Humans are lonely for other sentient spe species. I mean, we, we, we kind of wish we had something that would come along that was bigger and stronger and hopefully wiser and kinder than we are, but also might be bigger and stronger and vindictive and meaner and not caring at all about us. So we're kind of trying on these, these different roles about um, what would it be if the other truly existed in our world. <laughs> Um, as of this time, there are, there are, are no plans that, that I'm aware of. Frequently, uh, when something like that's being negotiated, your agent plays it close to his chest until it's time to talk with you about it. Sure. But at this point, as far as I'm aware, um, there is nothing. And you, when I look at the fact that this is, um, what, the, the 13th book? That's a lot of books. That's a tremendous amount of story. My personal feeling has always been that, um, uh, that short stories actually translate to the screen uh, better than novels. Novels translate better than extended works. Um, the exception would be something like what they're doing with Game of Thrones, which is to make it a, a multi-part, uh, a, a set of films telling the story rather than trying to say, okay, we're going to break this into three big movies. I don't think you could tell George's story that way. There's just too much of it. Actually, m my daughter tinkers in film a lot, uh, uh, and uh, so I've been uh, behind the scenes watching other stories get translated into film. I've seen what goes into them. Um, I think it'd be a lot of fun, but uh, because of the family situation, I think it's something we would almost want to do as, as close to home at, at first to see what happened. Um, would I be totally averse to it? Probably not, especially with the short story. You'd, you'd hand off the project to somebody that you really, really trusted, realized it was not going to be your story on the screen. It's going to be that person's experience of having read your story. And then open your hand and let it go. I'm, I have a very different, uh, um, I'm coming to it from a very different background than say George Martin who does have an extensive uh, background in, in writing for television uh, long before Game of Thrones uh, became a TV series, if you would. My pace is about one book a year. Yeah. So um, over the past probably about 27 years, I think, I've created one book a year, and that's uh, a pace that I can keep up as long as I write 
every day. Um, it, you know, if, if you write a thousand words a day, which is about um, three typewritten pages, at the end of the year you're going to have 365,000 page words. So you can take and you can throw away half of that and keep what you wrote that was good and still have a, a fairly massive fantasy novel. So it's, for me, it's a sustainable pace. Ebooks are definitely what we're going to move into. It's like, it's like looking back and saying, why aren't we using vinyl to record music on anymore? Um, because people found a way where you could carry more of your music with you. Um, certainly, uh, uh, if anybody here is old enough to remember jogging with a disc man and the, disc, the, the CD skipping, it was not the best experience. So it, it's, as technology marches forward, we're going to tell stories in different ways. And, and I'm happy for that. I do have a Nook, and it, it's very handy for when you want to load a whole bunch of stories for a longer trip. Um, if you can imagine, you know, going backpacking and how many books you can take on a device rather than, um, than carrying a, a backpack full of paperbacks, that it's definitely something that um, makes a huge difference in how much you can have with you. And, and there are also the wonderful um, interactive functions of, of e-books, which um, don't necessarily pertain to fiction, but if you have a, a, a field guide and you're out looking at birds and can look it up with an illustration and hear the bird's song, or um, if you are in a foreign country and you need to ask where a restaurant is, and you can open up a language guide and, say, and find your phrase and have your book ask where the restaurant is. The, the applications are endless, and people are going to, to use it. We have been moving steadily into a world where there is much more interaction with writers and readers than there used to be. Um, when I first began writing, if I, if I got a letter from a reader, it had usually passed through the publisher, and it was probably reaching me weeks, sometimes months later. And now, um, from the day the book is released, um, I'm getting feedback from readers and, and able to, uh, to listen to them, and in some cases to respond to them. Um, I think it gives readers a, a, a feeling of, of much greater connection to the book and to the author. Uh, it, it can be overwhelming. Um, I probably spend two hours a day on social media, which used to be two hours a day put into writing or into reading. I mean, when you change your schedule and when you take a piece of time and give it to something, something else has to give. So it, it, uh, it's, it's life-changing for, for writers who choose to do all the social media. Um, I think it does give a, a, a sense of uh, almost participation in the work to the readers. And I'll add that I have met readers from all over the world as a result of it. I spent this last weekend at um, LONCON 3, which is the World Science Fiction Convention. And while I was there, I saw uh, people who are mem members of uh, a website called Blood Memories, which is Italian readers who I had met before when I was in Italy. Um, I saw people that I had initially met over the internet because of fan art they had done for, my, for, for the books. Um, I met my cover artists in some cases. Uh, all of these people, these are all connections I would not have had without the, uh, the intersection. So it's, uh, I think it's, it, it enriches your life. Um, as, as, and, and it makes uh, friendships across much greater distances possible. I have always tried to write every book so that it would stand alone. Even, even the middle book in the trilogy, I've tried to, to make sure that there was a story arc that has a beginning, a middle, and an end that is somewhat satisfying, even if you can tell that there was more to the story to begin with and there is more to come. Because I have too often been the traveler stranded in the airport where all there was were books that were part of a series and, uh, and they were inc incomprehensible. So I do strive for that. Um, with that said, do I think Fool's Assassin is the best place to jump into my world? Um, 
I, I'll always prefer that the reader goes back to Assassin's Apprentice and reads their way forward through the world and catches all the nuances and, and comes to this and recognizes um, familiar faces. Uh, so my preference, of course, would be that you have read all 13 books. Of course. But um, I, I think uh, we'd have to ask that question about some, to, of somebody who had just jumped in on it and uh, ask them if it made sense. I'm a little too close to it. Before I began writing Rob, as Robin Hobb, I wrote as Megan Lindholm. And um, with, with one exception, where a book grew too long and was split into a two-volume story, um, I wrote all standalone books. Uh, as Robin Hobb, um, I have written always multi-part stories. Uh, my, my one attempt to write a, uh, a single volume story as, as Robin Hobb uh, failed miserably, it became a four volume. <laughs> so um, I think as I, I, I don't think that, that the style that I use writing as Robin Hobb lends to uh, short, succinct uh, stories or novels. I, I continue to write as Megan Lindholm. I do a lot of short stories as Megan Lindholm, and those are definitely standalone works. It's it's a difference in the voice and and um, how much embroidery you do. I think. <laughs>